welcome to the MJ Theory. Yeah! You want to see me spin? Watch. Yeah! Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MJ Theory. My name is Shay. I will be your humble host this evening, morning, day, night, whatever time it is and day that you are watching this right now. I am so excited that you are with me. And if you're tuning into this episode, by the way, this is the very, very first episode, so don't judge me too hard if I muck it up a little bit. But if you're watching this, it's because you saw the title and you either want to know the truth or if you already know the truth and you want to know if I'm speaking the truth. Um, and hey, I respect any and all reasons for why you're here. I mean, you're here, we're doing this together, and we're just gonna go through this and, and go with the motions and see what we can uh, figure out here. So, I'm gonna be talking about the 1993 Chandler's versus Michael Jackson um, molestation allegations. And, you know, it's really upsetting to me how uneducated people are about how blatantly obvious it was that that was an extortion attempt. I mean, it, it, Stevie Wonder could have seen it coming. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm. All jokes aside, it, it really was a an extortion attempt. Um, ooh, let's count how many times I say the word extortion. <laughs> So I'm going to be pulling information from this amazing article that I found on Reflections on the Dance. And this is an article that was written by a woman named Lisa, who is a, uh, she was a lawyer, and Christy, who is just a phenomenal writer, and they teamed up and they um, dispelled a lot of the rumors and, and brought a lot of the truth to light. A lot of truth that even I didn't know, and I am just flabbergasted. So... I mean, the, the freaking nerve of these people, of Evan Chandler and his lawyer, um, Rothman, Barry Rothman, I, I mean, the, these, these dudes had balls, man. I mean, I don't know what the fuck, but, um, yeah, there might be a lot of cursing in this, by the way. Uh, I'm, I'm just very passionate. So because the media in 1993 epically failed us and did not tell us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help them God, I am here. You are here. Let's figure this out. Now, I oftentimes have to explain to people how Michael met Jordy Chandler because for whatever reason, people think that Jordy just popped up into Michael's life out of fucking nowhere. So let me explain this really quick. Michael met Jordy Chandler when his car broke down in the summer of 1992. Outside of a, uh, I, I think it was either just outside of a rent a rec shop or it was down the street or he was towed there. In any event, he ended up at this rent a rec and the owner of this rent a rec was David Schwartz, who happened to be the stepfather of Jordy Chandler. And so David calls up uh, June, who is the mother of um, Jordy, obviously, and goes, uh, yo, guess whose car broke down and is standing in front of me, shining, shiny and sparkly and splendidly bright, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> come over here and bring Jordy, because they knew that Jordy was a huge Michael fan, and June had testified in the 2005 trial that Jordy was indeed a, a real big fan. He dressed like him with the sparkly jackets and the glove, the whole nine. He he was he was a stan for real. So June, oh, did you hear that? Oh. <laughs> so June brings Jordy to the rent rec and you know, and we all know how Michael was around adults. Michael was always very wary of adults because adults come with ulterior motives. Kids Kids don't. Kids are just kids. They, they they take everything at face value. If they like you, they like you. If they don't, they will let you know and they will not waste their time. So June, seeing that everything was going really, really well, she gave Michael their home phone number and said, hey, you know, give us a call. Give us a ring-a-ding-ding on our cellies and we'll hang out. That's, that's pretty, that's basically what happened. I mean, minus the cell phone bit. I mean, unless they had those big 
bricks that you, you carried in a briefcase and walked around with like a fool, like a fool. So Michael ended up calling them, but it wasn't until a couple of months later while he was on the European leg of the promotional tour for the Dangerous album. And we all know how much Michael loved to tour. I love to tour. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then in 1993, that's when Jordan and uh, his mom, June, and his half-sister, Lily, made their first trip to Neverland, and they stayed uh, two nights in one of the guest cottages. They drove up from L.A., and they, they had a great time, and then... Shortly after that, they pretty much became regulars at Neverland. They were always there, having a good time, playing with the monkeys, and riding the rides. And it became especially true that they became regulars when June and David split up. And this brings me to an interesting, an interesting theory. And it's not so much a theory as much as it is like an obvious observation. You know, like, why was nobody, why why has nobody brought this up or even thought about this? Or maybe you have thought about this. Has anybody considered that, you know, in all of this, he was touching the little boy? You know, like, okay, calm down. Has anybody considered that maybe he was interested in June and that's why he had them around so much? Has nobody considered this? Am I the only one? Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! <laughs> I don't understand. Um, th that's, that's just really interesting to me. Because, uh, you know, like, I mean, Michael was always very um, affectionate and doting. I mean, he even said, um, he mentioned during the, um, if you haven't listened to the Glenda tapes, I mean, I kind of low-key feel bad for listening because I feel like a little spy on the wall. A spy on the wall. <laughs> A spy on the wall. A fly on the wall. Could you imagine just like James Bond, like a teeny tiny James Bond just on your wall, just staring at you? <laughs> I'm so stupid. A fly on the wall listening. I felt like a fly on the wall listening to the, um, to the Glenda tapes. But he does mention... Um, during one of the, the t I'll find it and I'll, I'll link it down below. It's, it's on YouTube, um, where he's talking about how when he was with somebody, he was buying her stuff and, and giving her things and taking her places. And that's pretty much what he was doing with June. He was taking her places and essentially buying her things. First class plane tickets, which Evan was real thrilled about, by the way, but I'll get to that. Um, so yeah, that's just my theory. Like, maybe he was just super sweet on, I mean, I mean, he, he, he uses the term, uh, had my nose wide open. Michael used that term in the Glenda tapes. He had his nose wide open for somebody. I don't know who he was talking about. And no, Sean Amongatal, he was not talking about you. That's a whole other video for a whole other day. And then I also feel like it's important to mention that Michael also spent time at June's house with June and Jordy. And June testified, and this is important, she testified that she was always with Jordy or around in the vicinity whenever they were hanging out with Michael and that not just at her house, at Neverland, um, where they would go to um, places um, overseas, um, to, you know, Disney World and this and that, what have you, she was always around. And this is the question that I pose to the hater aids all the time when they say that Michael molested Jordy. And I'm like, let me ask you a question. How, how was he able to molest Jordy with his mother always around? How? She was always there. So there's that. And now the topic always comes up, you know, Michael slept in the same bed as Jordy. Michael slept in the same bed as Jordy. You know, everybody's always saying the same shit. And it's like, okay, they fell asleep in the same bed while they were watching a movie. They fell asleep. They, they zonked out. That's just what happened, you know? And she testified, June testified about this as well. And there's a, a little bit of a, basically... Um, I'll, I'll put a little snippet of it up here so that you guys can actually read it because I'm probably going to do some real shitty paraphrasing real quick. 
But basically, uh, the gist of the situation was Michael and Jordan were watching um, an Exorcist movie or a The Exorcist movie. I'm not sure. It doesn't specify. And it's not that it's important or anything. For all you film buffs out there, I don't know. Um, but basically, they fell asleep watching the movie. And, you know, and, and, and that would make any parent uncomfortable. And it did make June uncomfortable. You know, that's you felt like it's, it just doesn't look right it, it just doesn't look copacetic and and that's understandable and that doesn't make doesn't necessarily oh, is that a plane sorry but you know the the michael's intention was not to fall asleep obviously in the bed you know they were watching a movie and you know you fall asleep what can you do right but you know like i said it it, it just didn't look right but you know and, and june was telling Jordy, you know, whenever they would stay with Michael, you know, like, make sure you go to your bedroom or go to our bedroom, you know, you don't, don't, don't sleep in the bed with, with Michael. And it was always Jordy who said, I, but I, I want to go sleep with, with Michael in the bed. And this, this I'm going to talk about because Michael talked about this a lot when he said that he would share his bed with kids. And I think Macaulay Culkin actually said it best when he said that Michael is really, really bad at explaining himself. Well, the thing is, the thing is with that whole thing is that, you know, they go, oh, you slept in the same bedroom as him. It's like, I don't think you understand. Michael Jackson's bedroom is two stories. <laughs> and it has like, like three bathrooms and this and that. So when I slept in his bedroom, yeah, but you have to understand the whole scenario. And the thing is with Michael is that he's not very good at explaining himself. And he never really has been because he's not a very social person. I mean, he's, you're talking about someone who's been sheltered and sheltering himself also for the last like 30 years or, you know, and so... He's not very good at communicating to people and not very good at conveying what he's actually trying to say to you. And so when he says something like that, you know, people, you know, he doesn't quite understand why people react the way that they do. And I can see why, <laughs> because he's saying, oh, I, I share my bed with the kids and, and adults will, parents and everybody, they'll, they'll take that as, uh, like you're, you're sleeping, you're, you're sleeping in the bed with the kids. Is that, is that what you're telling me? And it's like, that's not what he, that's not what he means. He, he literally means he's giving it to the kids. This, like, this is now yours. Like when you, like, when you share something with somebody, you know, if somebody goes, hey, Shay, can I borrow that brush? Or can you share that brush with me? I'll be like, yeah, sure. Here, here, here's, here's my brush. And I don't hold on to the brush while they're brushing their hair. I literally give them the brush, you know, <laughs> that, and, and that's there. I shared it with them. And that's what Michael means when he says he shared the bed. He gave them the bed. Okay, when you say boys, it's not just boys. And I've never invited just boys to come in my room. Come on, that's ridiculous. And that's a ridiculous question. But like, since people want to hear it, you know, the answer, I'll be happy to answer it. I have never invited anyone into my bed ever. Children love me. I love them. They follow me. They want to be with me. But anybody can come in my bed. A child can come in my no, bed I if can they say, want. I can, I can say, sorry, I've seen this. I've seen it a lot. I've seen kids. I've seen him with children in the last year. I've seen it enough to where I can see how that can happen. It's, you know, I but understand. Isn't part of being an adult, and you have a two-year-old child, two-year-old huh. boy. Yeah, let me just, let me just, sorry. Okay. I, I just wanted to say that I've seen these children. They don't let him go to the bathroom without running in there with them, and they won't let him out of their sight. So okay. when he jumps in the bed, I'm even out. You know, they, they jump in the bed with him. And a lot of things that people don't talk about, and this is one of the greatest things that I found out reading this article. Michael, after this whole incident in 93, he hired a specific employee, a supervisor of sorts, to always be around whenever the kids were around. And his sole purpose, his only job, was to be like a witness to what was going on in the bedrooms, if anything was going on in the bedrooms, as far as sleeping goes and sleeping arrangements. And whenever a kid would it insist on sleeping in the bedroom with Michael, Michael would give them the bed and then Michael would go get the sleeping bags that he would keep, that he kept in Neverland, and put them on the floor so that he and his su the supervisor could sleep on the floor. And that's something nobody talks about. So that's just a little food for thought. Now, Geraldine Hughes, who is a, um, she, she's a writer. She wrote a book about Michael called Redemption. Now, she was a um, 
She worked in the law office of Barry Rothman, who would later become Evan Chandler's scumbag lawyer. And she said it really well. She put it quite eloquently how how kids will generally, if, if especially if they're somewhere away from home, they seek comfort in adults. And so she said it all the time. She, she's a, mis- a missionary. Excuse me. She's a missionary. And she will oftentimes have kids over for weekend sleepovers. And she's very careful to not have any of the boys in her room because, you know, she's a woman and just having a little boy in the room, it just doesn't look right. And she understands that. But the little girls will all the time, will follow her to her bedroom, jump on her bed. And, you know, they'll all just sit down and talk. And there's a lot of comfort in that kind of environment. I mean, and, and I can attest to the same thing. I have a niece and I have a nephew and both of them, especially when they were younger, more so my nephew now than my niece. Um, but my nephew always wants to come into my room. He's always knocking on my door and he's always asking me, you know, just for like random things coming into my room, playing with my cat, you know, just like there, there's a comfort in, in this kind of stuff. And, you know, and, and you can't deny that. So, and Michael was always very, very open and wanted to help kids and have that relationship and have that bond and and have those friends and but we'll get more into the psychology of Michael Jackson in another video. So now that we're all caught up on the facts of how Michael met Jordy and how it wasn't just Jordy that Michael was hanging out with and how Michael and the just just the the basic nature of their relationship and their friendship Let's go ahead and move on to a real son of a bitch, Evan Chandler. Money. Now, Evan Chandler was a dentist. And he, and he wasn't just any dentist. This, this dude was dentist to the stars. I mean, he was just filling up his little address book with all these contacts and which is how most likely he was able to co-write a movie with Mel Brooks and that movie was Robin Hood Men in Tights now that is the only thing that Evan did as far as screenwriting and he really 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 aspired to be a screenwriter and he low-key kind of did it um I will tell you, though, I did own a copy of Robin Hood Men in Tights up until the moment I found out that Evan Chandler had anything to do with it. You want to know what I did with my copy of Robin Hood Men in Tights? I ripped it. (laughs) Yeah, I did. I ripped it. Yeah, I got real petty real fast and I just I destroyed it. I didn't want it. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I haven't watched it since. Um, I mean, call me, you know, ridiculous. Ridiculous. Another interesting fact about Evan Chandler writing, co-writing Robin Hood Men in Tights is that Jordy actually had a lot to do with that. That was one of the things that Evan and Jordy bonded over was that the, the production of that film. And when Evan was writing that movie with Mel Brooks, a lot of the, the material in that movie is from Jordy from because Jordy was 11 when they when they made that movie in 92 and so Evan was using Jordy's material and then June made a statement saying that Evan didn't even give Jordy any money for the movie you know like five thousand dollars for your son like hey here you go like thanks for helping me out like no Evan didn't give his son jack shit except for major anxiety after this whole 93 trial. But anyway, uh, it wasn't really a trial, it was an allegation. Ruined that joke. So anyway, Evan was the dentist to the stars. Carrie Fisher was one of his patients. And it is super, super important that I mention this because I don't know why not enough people know about this. But Carrie Fisher would frequent Evan Chandler because Evan Chandler would do bullshit procedures on her just so that she could get a, a hit of the, of the morphine, of the painkillers. And 
and he knew what he was doing and she knew what he was doing and what she was doing. I mean, they were, you know, whatever. And then, and that just goes to show you Evan's character. But Carrie wrote in her autobiography how creeped out she was by Evan. Because when Michael came into Evan's life through Jordy and through June, Evan took it as an opportunity. And I'll get more into that in a second. But Evan used to just really creep out Carrie Fisher and say things like, Oh, yeah, my son is best friends with Michael Jackson and oh my son's like really attractive like and he would just say it in like a really weird skin crawly like why are you talking about your son like that kind of way you know and Carrie Fisher talks a lot about um, her own opinions on Evan Chandler and Michael Jackson and she and and her and Michael they, they were acquaintances more than they were friends they they saw each other very far, a few far and in between, you know, it's, it, so it wasn't like she was biased and she was, you know, all gung-ho for Michael, but she was calling a spade a spade. She was calling it like she saw it and she was creeped out. It rubbed her the incredibly wrong way and she just knew that Michael, that, excuse me, she just knew that Evan Chandler was up to something and he even told her I'm going to sue Michael Jackson. So she knew all of this was happening when she would be sitting down in the chair getting doped up and Evan would just talk her ear off about it. And then she finally just had to go find a different dentist, essentially find a different drug dealer <laughs> because she, she just couldn't handle it anymore. She couldn't take it. So I'll link that, that article below and where she talks about all of that. And you, you can read it. Another interesting thing about our pal Evan is that he wasn't just writing screen plays. No, no. He was also writing a diary. And in this diary, and I'm going to be referring to the article here, um, he made a diary entry in 1993 on April 16th, asking Carrie Fisher to contact Dr. Arnold Klein, who we all know is Michael's doctor, and she, he requested that she contact Dr. Arnold Klein to get some information about Michael. And according to the diary, Dr. Klein said that Michael was perfectly straight and that Evan had nothing to worry about. Now, Evan, seeing how much time Michael was spending with Jordy, because Evan was, was very a very possessive bloke. He... he if something was his, it had to be his. And, I mean, he, he has been described as being a hugely manipulative, um, conniving, um, borderline sociopathic. That last one is my opinion, anyhow. Um, but it's, it's not a secret that Evan hated Michael hanging out with Jordy and... It, it 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 really really shows the further we we dive into this you'll you'll understand a little bit more and so in may of 1993 evan became friendly with michael finally and you know and then he was he was loving the spoils of being friends with a rich and famous person you know and he just liked being a sidekick in the limelight you know getting you know just the the tail end, the the the, the few licks of, of what comes along with with being a buddy to a famous person. So he wasn't complaining too too much. So Evan, in his diary, he made another entry that's uh, also really telling. Um, this this is earlier when I was talking about that uh, those first class plane tickets. This is what um, I'm talking about. Um, he wrote in his diary. Um, the date is um, a little iffy. It was either May 7th or May 8th in 1993. And the entry reads, I went to the house to see Jordy, but they were in such a hurry, we didn't have time to talk. June showed me the $7,000 first class tickets Michael had sent over for the trip to Monaco. I was happy for her. A man was finally treating her good. Jordy looked great and acted the same as always. I had no suspicions. As they drove away, I remember thinking how great it would be if June divorced Dave and married Michael. 
she would finally have a great life with someone who treated her with respect. End quote. And that just f- fucking confirms my my theory from earlier, which is Michael was interested in June. Well, it doesn't really confirm it. I mean, it kind of just tickles it a little bit, you know what I mean? But I think, and, and then and, and even Evan is like, you know, team Michael, <laughs> like marry my ex-wife, but it's not for her because again, and, and I call him a sociopath because all of his decisions that he's making uh, and even the kudos that he gives somebody else, they're, they're really kudos for him. They're really, he, he cannot do something for somebody else unless it somehow positively um, impacts his own life. And the positive impact here is that Evan wanted Michael to be in Jordy's life, specifically Jordy, and also his own, because Evan was going to try to get something from from Michael out of all of this this huge extortion attempt gone awry. Um, but we'll talk about that. Let's backtrack a little bit here. And like I said, Michael wasn't just in this family's life for Jordy. Michael made all kinds of visits, and not just to June's house, but to Evan's house too. Because Michael, excuse me, not Michael, Evan remarried uh, a woman named, um, I think her name was Monique, and they had a son named Nikki. And on Nikki's birthday, Michael showed up to Evan's house for Nikki's birthday party. And... You know, Evan just loved that. I mean, he was just milking it for all it was worth. But it was before Nikki's birthday and Michael visiting for that, for the party, that Evan first voiced his quote unquote concern about the time that he was spending with uh, Jordy. And by just blatantly asking Michael if he was having sex with Jordy. And of course, Michael said no. And that was the thing, too. If if Evan was really that suspicious, he would not have encouraged Jordy to hang out with Michael so much. Oh, and he did. He encouraged that friendship so much. And Carrie Fisher even said it, says it in her autobiography. How much he wanted Evan to be friends with Michael. He like pushed Michael on, on Jordy for real. Because I'm a pusher. I push people. And this psychopath, it got to the point where Evan asked Michael to build an addition onto his house, onto Evan's house, so that Michael could stay there whenever he wanted. And it would have happened, Evan would have made that happen if the city it's like something happened with the permits and they weren't allowed to do it. So then Evan suggested that Michael buy him a bigger house so that there would be another room so that Michael could stay in there. I mean, this you cannot make this shit up. Now, people, hold on to your butts because this is when shit gets crazy. Hold on to your butts. Now, like I said before, Evan had his very mild issues with Jordan hanging out with Michael. He, I mean, he had heard about, you know, the sleepovers and this and that, what have you, the, at Neverland and, um, in Vegas, just everywhere that they went, you know, Michael was staying over and, you know, he's a dad and I'm not giving him any leeway or rooms for excuses here because he doesn't deserve it. But, um, he did express his concern But now, at this point, it's gotten to a place where he's using it as a pawn. He's using his suspicions as a pawn to, and and it's fueling his, his, his undeniable rage towards Michael. He hates Michael at this point, honestly, secretly deep down inside, because he is not getting what he wants from Michael Jackson. June's getting what she wants. Jordy's getting what he wants. Evan? Evan's not getting so much. He's he's chopped liver at this point. So now Evan's got to start working on his plan. The plan is already set in motion. They know what they're going to do. They're going to try to extort money out of Michael Jackson. And so at the end of June 1993, Jordy is getting ready to graduate from seventh grade. And, you know, traditionally, you know, there's there's the, the big end of the year dance with the peers and with the, the, the schoolmates, the classmates. But then Jordy goes, oh, you know what? I'm actually going to spend the evening with Michael. 
You know, that's just what he wanted to do. And Evan used this point as a way to start laying the foundation and the groundwork for what would later become an extortion attempt gone awry. So he expresses to June more concern over, oh, you know, I don't don't know about, you know, this hanging out with Michael stuff. I mean, you know, so he's just expressing his bullshit concerns. And Michael Freeman, who's June's attorney, he, he even said, he was like, June knew that his concerns were, um, to use her uh, direct quote, baloney. She thought the whole thing was baloney, which it was. It was baloney and cheese and mayonnaise. That's exactly what it was in between two pieces of bread and then Evan's stupid ass face right in the middle. Uh, Evan baloney sandwich. What are you? An idiot sandwich. So June decides that this would be the appropriate time to tell Evan, idiot sandwich, that... Michael invited both her and Jordy to accompany him on the Dangerous Tour. And Evan realizes, um, oh shit, I can't do, I can't hatch my plan if June takes Jordy a fucking on the other side of the world. Like, how am I supposed to, how am I supposed to do this? So basically, June kind of low-key gave Evan a deadline to get this whole plan into motion. So she told him that they would be leaving on August 15th, 1993. And, you know, and and, and I don't think June, like, expected any of this to happen. Honestly, I mean, because mind you, Evan, in the beginning of this whole relationship, when Michael first came into their lives, Evan was thrilled. Evan was stoked and he was excited. And then you remember the diary entry where he's all like excited that Michael bought them the $7,000 first class tickets and they're they're going to go hang out. And he even suggested that Michael marry June's ass. Like he's so bipolar. He's so all over the place. And June, June had no idea to, to expect or, or to suspect that Evan would have any issue with her taking Jordy overseas on the Dangerous Tour. So he, he's, he's just really working the room at this point. He, he is just trying so hard to make Michael look like the bad guy. And in tandem with this extortion attempt... Evan wanted to take custody, full custody away from June. Evan has had it with everybody at this point. He's had it with Michael's ass. He's had it with June's ass. And low key, he's had it with Jordy's ass. No one is safe from Evan Chandler. He he is, uh, he's crazy at this point. He's trying to take everybody down. And people, when I say he was pissed, I mean he was pissed. I'm angry. So on July 8th, David Schwartz records the famous phone call that would later be leaked to the press on September 2nd, 1993. And we all know what phone conversation I'm talking about. This man is going to be humiliated beyond belief. He will not believe it. He will not believe what's going to happen. It's beyond, it's beyond his worst nightmares. So one more record. If I go through with this, I will get big time. I will get everything I want. They will be destroyed forever. And in this whole conversation, Evan just seems so... Like, he he's so... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Offended. He's offended, and he feels like he's being ignored by everybody because no one was returning his phone calls. I mean, it, it had become all about Michael for June and Jordy. At least in Evan's eyes. And Evan was pissed about it. And he was intimidated by Michael's relationship with with his son and with his ex-wife. And in the recorded conversations, Evan says that he scheduled a meeting for the next day, July 9th, 1993. And he wanted Michael there, Jordy, June, and Dave. And they were all going to have this big talk. And if they didn't respond to him the way that he wanted them to respond to him, then he was going to enact a plan that would destroy everyone's lives but his own. And this is all in the transcripts of the recording 
of of the the phone call and of course the 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 clip the conversation in its entirety was not released to the media or at least no it was released to the media but the media did not release the full tape to the public you see what i'm saying we see what i'm saying but like this touches on what i said earlier and how the media reporting failed us as far as the truth is concerned but that's not news they're always fucking shit up so david during the recording he he's trying to pull information out of out of evan he's asking him questions and he's trying to figure out what this meeting is going to be about and there's a really telling quote um that's in the article that was pulled straight from the transcripts of that phone conversation and i'm going to go ahead and and read it to you and i'll put it up on the screen it says i had good communication with michael we were friends. I liked him and I respected him and everything else for what he is. There was no reason why he had to stop calling me. I sat in the room one day and talked to Michael and told him exactly what I want out of this whole relationship, what I want. End quote. God damn, Evan, you sound like a bitch. Like you 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 sound like a female. What is wrong with you? Oh my god! I'm a woman! Now just touching on that quote, June testified in 2005 and admitted that she had told the DA in 93 that Evan said that the relationship with MJ was a way for Jordy to not have to worry for the rest of his life. But she did not say what he meant by that comment and that she only, she was, she only speculated what he meant, but fucking Jesus Christ, we know what he meant. Like we're not dumb. We, we know what he means. I mean that, I mean, it's, it's called read between the lines. He means money. Money, money, money in my pocket. So David's still talking to him on the phone. He's still recording. And he asked him finally, like, how is this meeting? How How is this big confrontation going to affect Jordy? And Evan said, that's irrelevant to me. It'll be a massacre if I don't get what I want. It's going to be bigger than all of us put together. This man is going to be humiliated beyond belief. He will not sell one more record. If I go through with this, I win big time. There's no way I lose. I will get everything I want, and they will be destroyed forever. June is going to lose Jordy. She will have no right to see him again. End quote. Now, what does that sound like to you, ladies and gentlemen? That sounds like extortion. Do you hear it? you smell it now of course michael heard that tape and there's no way that he wasn't going to hear it and he said i knew then and there it was extortion he said it right in the tape end quote and i will refer you guys back a couple of seconds in this podcast so that you can tell me exactly what this looks and smells like and it's at this pivotal moment Michael turns everything over to Burt Fields, his attorney at the time, and to Burt Fields' private investigator, Anthony Pelicano. And uh, Anthony Pelicano, if you're listening, um, I know you're in prison, but if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, I'm so sorry. (laughs) I'm so sorry. And yes, Anthony Pelicano is in prison, but it's only because he's super good at his job. Yeah, Anthony Pelicano was arrested in 2008 for illegal wiretapping um, and racketeering. But he's a a private investigator. You know, whether or not the ends, you know, the ends justify the means, that kind of thing. All right. But yeah, so Anthony Pelicano, um, back in the 90s, he was known as the private eye to the stars. You know, he's done work for Chris Rock and Yoko Ono, Tom Cruise, just to name a few. And uh, he was known as the best P.I. to have on your side because he would get the truth no matter what. And he had a reputation for playing as a tough guy, you know, in order, you know, that good cop, bad cop. No, it was bad cop, bad cop, split personality, but the same personality coming at you at your face, getting the truth, getting the job done, that kind of thing. So, yeah, that was Anthony Pelicano. That was Anthony Pelicano. So that big meeting that Evan wants to have on July 9th, you know, he's like, everybody's got to be there. And of course, the day rolls around. July 9th is here. July 9th, 1993. And instead of meeting Evan, 
David and June played the tape for Pelicano. The tape of the entire conversation. And then, of course, Pelicano interviewed Jordy pretty much immediately after listening to that tape. And Jordy denied any and all claims of sexual abuse. Like, all of it. He he denied every bit of it. And he even denied ever seeing Michael naked. So we know who we have on Michael's side. We have uh, Bert Fields, who obviously is very good at hiring private investigators. And we have Anthony Pelicano, who is that great private investigator. Now we're going to talk about who Evan had on his side. And um, holy Christ, you guys, you can't make this up. Evan's attorney for this case was Barry Rothman. And Barry was a real son of a bitch. Okay, I mean, Evan was hanging out with like-minded people. You know, there's that old saying, show me who your friends are and I'll show you who you are. The people who you associate yourself with. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a direct reflection of who you are. Sorry about it. So Barry was literally the worst. And we have... Um, I have a quote here from a book written by Mary A. Fisher, and the quote says, Former employees say that they sometimes had to beg for their checks, and sometimes the checks that they did get would bounce. He didn't keep legal secretaries. He'd demean and humiliate them. Temporary workers fared the worst. He would work them for two weeks and then run them off by yelling at them and saying they were stupid. Then he'd tell the agency he was dissatisfied and he wouldn't pay. End quote. So he was a deadbeat too. Oh my God. And Barry had a brush with the ethics committee. The ethics committee. Fisher writes again, that's a quote from her book. The California State Bar's 1992 disciplining of Rothman grew out of conflict of interest matter. A year earlier, a client, Muriel Metcalf, whom he'd been representing in child support and custody proceedings, had kicked Rothman off a case. Metcalf later accused him of padding her bill. Four months after Metcalf fired him, Rothman, without notifying her, began representing the company of her estranged companion, Bob Brutzman. The case is revealing for another reason. It shows that Rothman had some experience dealing with child molestation cases before the Jackson scandal. Metcalf, while Rothman was still representing her, had accused Brutzman of molesting their child, which Brutzman denied. Rothman's knowledge of Metcalf's charges didn't prevent him from going to work for Brutzman's company, a move for which he was disciplined. End quote. So this dude is a real ethical fucking nightmare. And he doesn't shy away from these kinds of cases when he has really no business being on these kinds of cases just because he's not an ethical person. Oh my God. And then Evan, on that famous tape recording in the transcripts, he says this about his attorney, Bob. Bob? Bobby? (laughs) It was Bob. (laughs) Evan was recorded on that famous tape saying... There are other people involved that are waiting for my phone call that are in certain positions. I've paid them to do it. Everything's going according to a certain plan that isn't just mine. Once I make that phone call, this guy is going to destroy everybody in sight in any devious, nasty, cruel way that he can do it. And I've given him full authority to do that. I picked the nastiest son of a bitch I could find. All he wants to do is get this out in the public as fast as he can, as big as he can, and humiliate as many people as he can. He's nasty, he's mean, he's smart, and he's hungry for publicity. End quote. Now, it's interesting that he said this about the the whole everything's going according to a certain plan because uh, remember earlier I was talking about Geraldine Hughes and she worked in the um, law office of, of Barry Rothman. She had only worked there for two months prior to him getting the, the Michael Jackson case. And she was going to quit. She was, she was going to leave. She didn't want to take any more of this bullshit. I mean, who would? But she decided to stay because she had overheard things the way that they were planning on 
handling the case and all of their plans. She used the word plans a lot because she did write a book called Redemption about Michael and how he was extorted. And so she stayed in the office and worked with them on the case, not really working like to help them in any capacity. She was more the lady who would type up the letters and, you know, this and that and what have you. A lot of paperwork. But she stayed so that she could get all the information necessary to help exonerate Michael later. And Michael's whole family knew about the book. Michael knew about the book. Michael read the book. He loved the book. And there's a great interview that she um, she gave that's up on um, Reflections of the Dance. I'll put a link to her interview below as well. That is an incredibly important interview. You don't really have to read the whole thing to get a gist of what was going on just in that office. Um, but I do urge you to read the whole article. It's it's really great. She says a lot of really sweet things about Michael. Um, you guys you guys will like it. So go ahead and give that a look. Give that a once over. So moving back to Barry Rothman, he had spoken to a psychiatrist by the name of Mathis Abrams. And when he did so, he Barry used his own words and hypothetically described Jordy's and, and Michael's relationship. Hypothetically described it. As in, oh, if he was being molested, if this, if that, if that, blah, 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 blah. And Abrams didn't, he, he didn't examine Jordy. He didn't talk to Michael and he didn't talk to Evan to come to, to a, a better conclusion or to his own opinion as he should have. Instead, all he said to Barry Rothman was, oh, well, based on what you've told me, I, I'm required to report the matter. And as, as psychiatrists are, they, they are required by law. Uh, he's a mandated reporter. You have to report any crimes, anything that's against the law, especially if it has to do with a minor. Especially if it's sexual molestation. And Barry Rothman knew that. And so he kind of set Abrams up here a little bit. But that still doesn't excuse Abrams not conducting his own interviews. I mean, that's just ridiculous ridiculous and mathis abrams is the exact same psychiatrist that the arvizos used when they accused michael jackson of sexual molestation <gasps> so based solely on what barry rothman told him abrams wrote up a letter saying that reasonable suspicion exists that sexual abuse may have occurred you you and this was all Barry and Evan needed to get the ball rolling on their ridiculous plan. Ridiculous! So after Evan went crazy and had that phone call with David where he was demanding everybody show up for this meeting and nobody came. Sounds like a lot of my birthday parties. But anyway, so he went crazy and nobody came to this meeting. Um, Evan ended up asking June if he could keep Jordy for a few days. Now, June had sole custody over Jordy, but they had a real amicable relationship up to that point, and they had a long-standing, um, kind of like a personal visitation schedule set up. Um, but, you know, and that just brings up the question, like, June, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Why would you let him take Jordy? You, you, you heard the tape. You know that this fool is freaking crazy, and is out to get all of you. <laughs> like, so why would you just be like, oh, you're crazy? You want to hang out with your son? Oh, cool. Have him back by nine. <laughs> like, okay, sure. So yeah, she gave him, uh, she gave Jordy to him. And um, so Evan took Jordy on July 11th, 1993. And, you know, there's Rothman fucking promising to have Jordy back a week later. But, of course, that didn't happen. That didn't happen at all. So no one knows when Evan specifically asked Michael for $20 million. But he did imply it in the phone call with David that he was going to demand it as early as that meeting on July 9th. The one that he tried to force everybody to go to. And there's a real lengthy quote 
um, that is just perfect. And it really, really, it, it really just, it just describes everything that he was trying to do. Um, so Evan said, let me put it to you this way. I have a set routine of words that I'm going to go in there that I have been rehearsing and I'm going to say, okay, because I don't want to say anything that could be used against me. So I know exactly what I can say. That's why I'm bringing the tape recorder. I have some things on paper to show a few people and that's it. My whole part is going to take two or three minutes and I'm going to turn around and that's it. There's not going to be anything said other than what I've already told, what I've, excuse me, what I've already been told to say. And I'm going to turn around and leave and they're going to have a decision to make. And based on that decision, I'll decide whether or not we're going to talk again or whether it's going to go further. So basically, and then he can end quote, and then he, <laughs> sorry. So basically he continues to go on to say, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he says something, something to the effect of he's going to hop on the phone and he's either going to tell whoever's on the other end, like, okay, go ahead with the plan or okay, don't go yet. Um, so he, he's, he has thought this over. This was all premeditated. This is something that he's been sitting on and pondering for a long time. And then there's another quote here where Evan says, all I can think about is I only have one goal and the goal is to get their attention. And as long as they don't want to talk to me, I can't tell them what my concerns are. So I have to go by step by step each time escalating the attention getting mechanism. And that's all I regard him as, as an attention getting mechanism. Unfortunately, after that, it's totally out of, and then there's some type of tape irregularity and there's a, we can't really read that. Continuing the quote, he says, it'll take on so much momentum of its own that it's going to be all out of our control. It's going to be monumentally huge and I'm not going to have any way to stop it. No one else is either at that point. To go beyond tomorrow, that would mean I have done every possible thing in my individual power to tell them to sit down and talk to me. I got to escalate the attention-getting mechanism. He's the next one. I can't go to somebody nice. It doesn't work with them. I already found that out. Get some niceness and just go fuck yourself. End quote. And, you know, and and what he's saying is, is true. Once he he made the allegations and they made it public there really was no stopping that ball that 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 snowball kept going and going and going and it got completely out of evan's control i mean this thing turned into a circus and it i feel like it it really put a lot of pressure on evan like like almost too much pressure but you know what fuck him i don't have any sympathy for him you 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 fucking made your bed lie in it drown you know what I mean so um anyway digressing um before any allegations were made public remember Evan's diary his handy dandy diary Evan recorded in his diary a demand of 20 million dollars and you know who who reported that it was Diane Diamond from hard copy and we all know the hard copy is less than um forgiving as far as um the michael allegations so at this point the conversations between michael and his attorney and evan and his attorney have begun and geraldine hughes speculated that michael may have felt bad bad for not giving evan the money to start up a new film project because that's how jordy and him bonded like on the set of robin hood men in tights and, you know, Michael was always real sensitive to people's pain. I mean, even when they were the ones causing him pain. And I, I always thought that that was an interesting, um, it's almost like a character foil when you think about it. It's really interesting. So Michael, you know, because obviously Michael's listening to, to Evan during these meetings and Evan, you know, did express, I mean, Evan, it's almost like Evan cared more about the fact that Michael was tearing apart his family in his eyes, more so than these fabricated child molestation allegations. And it's like, <laughs> where the fuck do your priorities lie, dude? <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> Excuse me, I think I'm 
Sorry, I have the hiccups. I have the blues. And in the uh, taped phone conversation, he's talking to Dave. And Evan says, let me put it to you this way, Dave. Nobody in this world was allowed to come between this family of June, me, and Jordy. That's evil. That's one reason why he's evil. I spoke to him about it, Dave. I even told him. And there's some tape irregularity and you can't really make out the end of it. But he he's saying it right here that he's pissed at Michael and he's calling him evil for coming in between him and his family. This is a very insecure, sociopathic man. Uh, I, I don't know how else to describe him. I mean, honestly, this is, this is just insane. And then getting down to the brass tacks of this whole situation, David asked Evan if he thought Michael was fucking Jordy. He put it very bluntly. To which Evan replied, I don't know. I have no idea. The fuck? All he had as proof was that shitty letter that Abrams wrote after Barry Rothman pretty much strong-armed him into writing it. Write it! Write it or I'll break it off! Jordy didn't even confirm any sexual misconduct with Michael. But that all changed on August 2nd, 1993. So, almost a year after the allegations, on May 3rd, 1994... An investigative reporter from KCBS-TV in L.A. reported that Evan Chandler injected the drug sodium amytal into his son during a routine dental procedure on August 2nd of 1993. The report further states that while under the effects of the drug, the boy confessed that he had been sexually abused by Michael Jackson. Now, here is the problem. Okay, sodium amytal is an incredibly, incredibly powerful drug, which has been incorrectly referred to as a truth serum, but it's anything but. <laughs> that is not correct. Sodium amytal is a barbiturate, and basically, this drug makes whoever's under the, its influence incredibly, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It makes people incredibly suggestible. So anybody under the effects of this drug could be saying absolute and utter nonsense and things that are just blatantly untrue. And it was originally administered for the treatment of amnesia and it became popular during World War II. They used it on the soldiers who were traumatized by war and they needed to forget. <laughs> you know, they needed to replace those memories with some other kind of memories. And the thing about sodium amidol is that when you're being questioned while you're under the influence of that drug, if the questions are asked correctly, the person will respond with the question as part of their answer. You see what I'm saying? It's, um, it's very similar to that scene uh, from Aladdin, you know, when Jafar's holding that little snake stick in front of the, the sultan's face and um his eyes start twirling and jafar tells him something and then he re repeats it back all fucking hypnotized and and shit like that that's exactly what it's like you will order the princess to marry me i will order the princess to... but you're so old and when evan was asked did you did you drug your son? Um, Evan, oh, he, he said, if I used it, it was for dental purposes. And then he admitted later that he, that he did use the drug. And so basically the story of him using the sodium amidol is he was pulling one of Jordy's teeth and he administered this drug as um, some type of um, anesthesia. And... The story is when Jordy came to, he just blatantly confessed that um, Michael had assaulted him. And then the story ranges from Evan had asked him a bunch of questions and kind of manipulated Jordan's answers um, into swaying him more into saying that he was molested. Um, so the stories go all over the place. And Geraldine Hughes... 
I talk about her a lot, but but that's just because she is one of the best people to to refer to. She was in that um, legal office. She was up close and personal. So she was. She thinks that the sodium amidol story isn't true at all. It's just a way to explain away how they found out about the alleged abuse. But that's really contradictory because first, Evan meets Michael in Bert Bert Fields, his attorney, and waves the letter that Dr. Abrams wrote around as the bargaining chip, threatening to use it to take MJ down if Evan doesn't get what he wants. And then all of a sudden, they changed the means of how they got the information to Evan using the drug sodium amidol during a routine dental procedure and then all of a sudden Jordy spills the truth. <laughs> like there's so many inconsistencies to Evan's entire plan and it only further pushes Geraldine's apt suspicion that this was indeed just a planned extortion attempt. I mean all of like and Evan lost total control over this entire situation from the moment it started. He was incredibly out of his league. I don't know what he was thinking. So anyway, digressing back to sodium amidol, um, it's not a reliable source to produce any sort of facts. Um, I'm not even sure if um, confessions that are given under the effects of this drug are even admissible in a court of law in America, you know? And um, there's a a story about um, this woman named Holly Ramona from the 1990s who was put under the influence of that drug by her psychiatrist when she was um, having, uh, she was seeking therapy for bulimia and depression. And this doctor put her under the sodium amidol and literally planted false memories in her head of her father raping and sexually assaulting her and even forcing her to, to go down on their family dog. Like this was, this was insane. And this psychiatrist was, um, I think they even did an episode, uh, on, on law and order SVU about this. I, I think I remember that. And, um, basically when, when it first went to trial for the Holly Ramona case, the dad was convicted, but then they did, uh, another trial to overturn that ruling and they showed all of the, the proof about sodium amidol, and then the case got thrown out, and the charges were dropped. I mean, that just goes to show you. Like, sodium amidol, it's, it's no go. So, and Jordy was interviewed by a psychiatrist named Richard Gardner after the sodium amidol story came out. And Jordy, Jordy said, My father had to pull my tooth out one time, like while I was there. And I don't like pain, so I said, could you put me to sleep? And he said, sure. So his friend put me to sleep. He's an anesthesiologist. And when I woke up, my tooth was out, and I was all right, a little out of it, but conscious. And my dad said, and his friend was gone, it was just him and me. And my dad said, I just want you to let me know, did anything happen between you and Michael? And I said, yes. And he gave me a big hug, and that was it. End quote. (laughs) <laughs> and again, the sodium amidol is, it makes you so suggestible. And and that question is just so ambiguous. Did anything happen between you and Michael? I mean, if this story is even true, if this story holds water, which I seriously doubt, I really, really doubt it because that the, the letter from Dr. Abrams was the gun that Jordy needed to end a Jordy, that Evan needed to destroy everybody. So why would he turn around and go get a knife, which isn't as good as the gun? You know what I mean? Just trying to use some analogies. <laughs> and as I said before, sodium amidol can put false memories in your head, as was the case with Holly Ramona and with the World War II soldiers. It is not, by any stretch of the imagination, some type of truth serum at all. So on August 4th, Evan and Jordy met with Michael and Pelicano, and Evan hugged Michael, like affectionately, which is a little odd considering the nature of the meeting, because this was when they were starting their negotiations. This is before anything went public. This is when things are still private. This is when Evan is saying that Michael sexually abused his son, 
And instead of going to the police, instead of taking him straight to a criminal trial, they have to do, he, he decides to do all these little meetings to negotiate for some type of payout. I mean, if that's not a red flag, I don't know what is. And then the fact that he came in and he hugged Michael. I mean, if you're there to confront the man that you believe sexually abused your son, you don't hug him. You kill him. Anyway, and not to mention that it was only two days prior that Evan supposedly drugged his son to get some type of piss-poor confession out of him. So anyway, Evan had the letter Abrams had written based off of Rothman's hypothetical relationship between MJ and Jordy and started to read off of it. And like he was all smug and shit, just reading all of the, the, the stuff that Abrams had written, suggested in this letter as far as um, there being suspicions of sexual assault. And the meeting lasted all of five minutes before Evans started ranting and raving and throwing threats around to ruin Michael. And according to Pelicano, it was at this time that Evan demanded $20 million. Evan wanted Michael to help him set his foot in the door as a serious screenwriter, or else he would accuse Michael of molesting his son. This is extortion 101, people. And it and it's $20 million. It's the same amount that Evan had stated in his diary. Like, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't make this any more clear to you guys if I beat you with it. What the hell are you doing? Larry! Larry, you can't just... Oh, Larry! Oh, are you all right? How did you... Larry! So the $20 million that Evan wanted, he was going to divvy it up between four movies. $5 million to produce each production. And this... This whole deal would have made Michael and Evan business partners, which is, again, very weird, a very weird thing to do if Evan truly thought Michael molested his son. So on August 5th, Michael refused the demands that Evan was wanting, rendering Evan's attempt at negotiating a complete and total failure. So Evan wrote a letter to Barry Rothman looking for a financial settlement rather than a trial, which is, again, suspicious. Why wouldn't Evan have gone for a criminal trial? Why not try to put MJ in prison for molesting his son? And Evan's letter said, I believed that Michael was a kind, sensitive, compassionate person who made a mistake in judgment born out of an honest love for Jordy. End quote. And he claimed in the letter as well that he was wrong for thinking that Michael had just made a mistake, that it was all out of love, but but that it was really just a heinous act, and that's why he wants all this money and shit. It's it's just ridiculous. I mean, I can't even say it with a straight face, guys. (laughs) So Evan did state that if they needed to proceed to a criminal trial, that Jordy would testify, but this was an obvious scare tactic, since Evan had no interest in doing a criminal trial. Why did he have no interest in doing a criminal trial? Well, because for a criminal trial, if you lose, you don't get to do a civil lawsuit because that's what gets you money. So the risk was too high. He knew he was going to fucking lose that criminal trial. He knew it. So he skipped all that. He skipped that noise and went straight for for the win, which was going to be the $20 million. So MJ ended up counter-offering Evan with three movies to be financed by Fox. But then again, this is this is more so speculation coming from um because this is coming from Pelicano. There's no there's no proof. Pelicano um relayed this information to somebody else. And that is actually an interesting move if it is true, considering that Fox is a pretty prestigious company and it's really risky to get them involved, especially when Evans threatening Michael with child molestation and he could pull that card out of his back pocket at any time. I mean, if Michael were to piss him off because he parked in his favorite parking spot, my, Evan could just whip out that letter and smack Michael in the face with it. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a real risky move if that is true. So on August 13th, Pelicano met with Rothman for yet another attempt to renegotiate. But Pelicano stormed out saying, no way, that's extortion. And a few people um, were around to hear that. So negotiations went on with Michael countering again, 
with three film scripts at $350,000 each. Now, Geraldine Hughes believes that MJ's counteroffers stemmed from his guilt of feeling responsible from breaking, for breaking apart Evan's family, as Evan had claimed. And like I said earlier, Michael was always very, very, very sensitive to people's pain. And his counteroffers would allow Evan the time to be with his son while also resolving the custody dispute as well, since Evan was still actively trying to take custody away from June. And speaking of which, since Evan still hadn't returned Jordy to June, as he and Rothman promised, June and her attorney, Michael Freeman, filed a motion to have Jordan returned by an emergency application, which is an order to show K to show, excuse me, which is an order to show cause and required an appearance before the court on August 17th, 1993. And using this method also required the opposing party to provide proof as to why Jordy should not be returned to his legal home with his mother. Now, this motion is what halted everyone in their tracks. It it threw a wrench in Evan's plans, it threw a wrench in Rothman's plans, and Evan didn't mention anything about child molestation in the opposing paperwork that they submitted to the court, a fact that clearly would have gotten Evan both legal custody of his son and a criminal case against Michael. But let's face it, That's not what Evan wanted. Evan wanted money. He wanted the moolah. He wanted the green, the frog skin. That's what he wanted. And because Evan didn't have any viable reason in his opposing paperwork as to why he shouldn't return home with June, the court ordered that Evan be returned, excuse me, that Jordan be returned to his mother by August 17th, 1993. And they ultimately denied Evan's request that Michael Jackson be prevented from spending time with Jordy because remember, Evan painted Michael as a bad influence on his son. But he didn't mention anything to Judgy Wudgy that, oh, by the way, I think Michael fiddled my kid's diddle, if you know what I mean. No, no. Because like I said, Evan wanted money. And all of this stuff with the custody and, and the, the ex parte with the, uh, with the court, it threw Evan off. And this is when the bomb goes off. Because on August 17th, 1993, instead of giving Jordy back, Evan took his son to Dr. Mathis Abrams, the same doctor who wrote that little note saying that there's suspicion of sexual assault. And Evan, not Jordy, recounted tales of molestation that allegedly occurred to his son at the hands of Michael Jackson. And Dr. Abrams, a psychiatrist, as a mandated reporter reported the allegations to the Department of Children and Family Services, DCSF, DCFS. I always do that. And the DCFS reported the claim to the police, who began a very lengthy and very expensive investigation into the make-believe crimes of Michael Jackson. So all of you taxpayers from the years 93 to 97, yeah, um, guess where uh, Evan made sure all your tax dollars went? Yeah, sorry about that. So inevitably, the news of the allegations was leaked to the media. No surprise. But it was leaked to one tabloid reporter in particular, Diane Diamond of Hard Copy. And Hard Copy, like I said before, it it was held as one of the most um, aggressively dishonest uh, programs on the air. And Diamond even stated that It was either going to be a superstar being falsely accused, or it was going to be a superstar perhaps guilty of one of the most heinous crimes we know. So either way, I couldn't lose. End quote. This bitch was all about the ratings. She didn't give a damn about Jordy or Michael or Evan, guilty, innocent, whatever. She just wanted whatever was going to rack in the viewers and, and boost her ratings. Bitch. So between August 23rd and 24th, 1993, the LAPD searched Neverland Ranch and Michael's Century City condo, which was kind of like his hideout condo. But that was never talked about in the press, that Michael's um, hideout hideout condo was searched. They only um, focused on Neverland being raided. Um, So on August 24th is when Pelicano stepped forward to reveal that the accusations were the result of an extortion attempt at the hands of Evan Chandler. Of course, 
Hardly any media outlets really reported on that one. They were all too too fascinated and and just thirsty for for Michael to be guilty. You know, because in the eyes of the media, in the eyes of the public, it's guilty until proven innocent, which is totally fucked up. But, you know, tell them that it's human nature. So anyhow, during the search of Neverland, the sheriff seized two photographic book essays. The first, called The Boy, a photographic essay, which was an art book depicting photos taken during the 1963 shooting of the movie Lord of the Flies. And MJ inscribed inside the book, Look at the true spirit and happiness on the faces of these boys. This is the spirit of boyhood, the childhood I never had. This is the life I want for my children. MJ. End quote. Now, a second book, Boys Will Be Boys, contained the inscription to Michael from your fan, Rhonda, XXX, OOO, Heart, Rhonda, 1983, Chicago. End quote. Now, there was no evidence that Michael ever opened this book. Michael had so many books. It, it, it's been said over and over and over again. He, he had like a, a library in his house, a full on library. And most of these books that he had gotten, especially art books, were from his fans. And he kept anything that fans gave him. I mean, you, you see him all the time. Um, if he is doing, if he's walking just from from a building to, to a limo, if somebody's holding out a piece of paper for Michael, if it's like a painting or whatever, Michael will grab it or he'll tell his security, go go get that. You know, he, he was a huge admirer of art. He was an incredible artist himself. And he loved, loved the, he, he loved the human anatomy, number one. He, he was always really fascinated with that and he's spoken on that publicly. What interests me most about life um, is learning, finding out new things, exploring different worlds. Um, I'm so interested in the human anatomy now, and the brain, and, mm -hmm. and um, so many different things like that, and the bones and everything. Um, and that's not illegal. It's not against the law. And neither were either of these books. Neither of them were child pornography. And believe me, if, they, if it was child pornography, guarantee you there would have been an arrest. For sure. They were so hungry to find some type of child porn in this house. It gets ridiculous. Um, and then also speaking on the uh, inscription that Michael put in um, The Boy, a photographic essay. I mean, that kind of low-key hurts a little bit <laughs> to read that. Um, I mean, he, he, he's being so genuine in that inscription when he said, look at the true spirit and happiness on the faces of these boys. This is the spirit of boyhood. Remember, Michael Jackson did not have a childhood. He was uh, a, like a, a essentially a, a short adult. You know, he, he was forced into, into working. And before anybody goes there and says, oh, I wish I was performing at these places and I wish I was friends with celebrities and I wish I was making millions and billions of dollars to sing and it's like yeah on the surface that's cool and I'm pretty sure Michael and all of his brothers thought that that shit was cool too but after like a year or two it gets old and not that he doesn't he never it's not that he didn't appreciate because he was all he always said his fans were his world his fans were his life he was married to his fans he loved what he did. He was so passionate, workaholic, absolute perfectionist. But he just wanted to be a kid. He just wanted to be a kid. And that was taken from him. And he traded that. He traded playtime and having friends and sleepovers. And he traded all that to be an entertainer. And that wasn't even a choice he made for himself. That was something that his dad put all the boys into I mean you know I'm I'm not complaining because you know without Joe Jackson being you know the um pretty much the glue that kept that whole group together um we wouldn't have 
you know, the Jackson 5 and the Jacksons and Michael and we wouldn't be able to laugh at Jermaine's hairline. Like, you know, there's all kinds of things that we just wouldn't have without Joe Jackson. Um, so anyhow, you know, that's just how I feel about that inscription. And and for them to, to take that as evidence, like I would understand if Michael's inscription said, ooh, look at that fine piece of ass <laughs> on page 39. <laughs> like, but that's not that's not what was in there. It's, that's not what was in there at all. It was a book. It was not pornography. It was a book that was sold in in probably a Barnes and Noble. <laughs> like a Barnes and Noble isn't gonna sell child pornography. And that other book, I'm, I'm not sure what was in that book or why it was seized, but it's from a fan. And Michael will always take anything from his fans. People know my love for children. So they send me books from all over the world, from South America, from Germany, from Italy, from Sweden. So if people have, say that, that they found those things, if there's an indication, let them come forward, let them produce them, right? Yeah, because I get all, I, I get all you, you wouldn't believe the amounts of mail that I get. And if you say to somebody, you know, if I let the fans know I love Charlie Chaplin, I'll be swarmed in Charlie Chaplin paraphernalia. One of the but if questions. I say I love children, which I do, they swarm me with everything pertaining to kids. So in October 1993, while the Jacksons were in Arizona attending the funeral of Joseph Jackson's father, Michael's grandfather, the police raided the Havenhurst home located in Encino. And this is, I'm telling you, this, this, this part, when I read this, when I tell you, I was doubled over laughing. Oh my God. I, uh, oh man. So they raided uh, the Havenhurst home located in Encino and they found a videotape labeled chicks. And they were like, they thought they had hit the, the gold mine. They were like, oh my God, this is it. This is child porn. This has got to be child porn. It just says chicks on it. I bet you they're not chicks. They're little boys, you know, and they, they took the tape, they seized it and they brought it back to their office and they popped it in the, the VHS player, the VCR. And for those of you who don't know what a VCR is, um, you know, that's what us ancient folk used to watch movies on. But anyhow, they popped it in to the VCR. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there were chicks on that tape. But they were chicks. As in chicken. <laughs> they thought, could you imagine? They're all these grown ass men and women all sitting like just ready to like watch this, to, 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 to just nail, to push the nail into Michael's coffin. And be like, yeah, we found this child porn. And they're all sitting there getting ready. And there's just all these chickens. <laughs> Look at all those chickens. And why, why was there a tape just full of chickens in the Havenhurst home? Like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But it wasn't child porn. And if the cops, like I said, if the cops had found kitty porn, undeniable kitty porn, then best believe an arrest would have been made. Like with Mark Salling, those of you who know who Mark Salling is, you know, he was the, the actor on Glee who just last year, I think it was either last year or very, very early this year, um, he was indicted on child pornography and he was um, set to go to, to prison and just a couple of days before he was about to be admitted into prison, he hung himself from a tree. He killed, he killed himself. The cops don't play play around with porn, child porn. They don't they don't play. It doesn't matter who you are. And Mark Salling was he was he wasn't an A-list celebrity, but he was a celebrity. They nailed his ass. They got him. And especially since the police were so bloodthirsty for some type of a conviction. This was so high profile. It's ridiculous. I I bet you all these cops had wet dreams about closing this case. I'd put my bottom dollar on it. So yeah, the police sees a bunch of other videotapes too, but those ones showed no criminality as well. Absolutely nothing. And then on August 25th, that's when some of Michael's younger friends, like Wade Robson... Boo! You stink! I'm literally twitching right now. I hate him. I'll do a whole video on him later. So Wade Robson and all of uh, other a bunch of Michael's other friends came forward to defend him, and then Michael's representatives continued to report 
on the extortion attempts by Evan. And like I said, major media outlets, not only didn't they cover the um, extortion attempt, but they didn't cover the support from MJ's friends. And so it really looked like Michael was alone. And in all respects, he was. People turned their backs on him to protect their own images. I mean, it it's infuriating and it's frustrating. And I want to do a whole video on all of the celebrities who love to call Michael Jackson their best friend in 2018, but turned into ghosts in 2005. We'll talk about that. Anyhow, on August 26, 1993... Geraldine Hughes wrote in her diary that she overheard Evan Chandler inside of um, Barry Rothman's legal office saying, it's my ass on the line and in danger of going to prison, end quote. So, I mean, the pressure is on and, and the heat is on and Evan cannot handle being in the kitchen anymore. It is, it's too much for him and it's, and it's really starting to show at this point, at this stage in the game. And this is where it gets real interesting. As if it wasn't interesting already. This is a goddamn circus. So when DCFS became involved, the Chandlers retained Gloria Allred to protect Jordy's interests. On September 3rd, 1993, Gloria stated with confidence to the press that Jordy was ready and willing to testify and have his day in court. But just seven days later, on September 10th, 1993, Allred suddenly left the case with no explanation. And Gloria Allred was always a publicity seeker. She was tough and cutthroat. She's not known for walking away from a winnable case. With that in mind, it's interesting that she chose to walk away from the Jordy Chandler case. And she did so because there was no case. There was no case, and she knew it. She got the hell out of Dodge. She was smart. She's a little son of a bitch, too. But she was smart. She was a smart son of a bitch. She got as far away from that toxic waste as she could. So on September 7th, 1993, the DCFS asked the FBI to assist them in their investigation as well. And as a result of the Freedom of Information Act, in 2009, the FBI released all of its files on the 93 case and everything from their intermittent involvement on dates spanning from September 16th, 1993, all the way through January 24th, 1997. And there have been so many thorough reviews of that file and every single review revealed that other than the accuser in 93 and 2005, both of which, like I said, shared the same lawyer and psychiatrist, No other claim was taken seriously. And believe me, all of the loons came out to play with their own stories. Um, Ex-employees from uh, Neverland who had quit years prior to these allegations all of a sudden came out with their own stories. And, and, oh, I saw Michael do this. And, oh, I saw Michael do that. And I could get into it, but it's, it's a lot and none of their stories were taken seriously and it's uh it it was a circus maybe i'll talk about it in another video um or if you want to read about it you can go to the link below to the article um where they talk they talk about it in depth so you can read up on it um on september 14th 1993 attorney larry feldman filed a lawsuit on jordy's behalf through his guardian, Adela Tim, claiming that Jackson had committed sexual battery within and without the state of California, ultimately seeking relief on seven separate counts. Sexual battery, battery, seduction, willful misconduct, intentional infliction of emotional distress, fraud, and negligence. And when that motion was filed, Michael's attorney filed a counterclaim of extortion against Evan Chandler and the DA opened its own criminal file. This is when Tom Snedden became involved. There will be charges filed against Mr. Jackson. We know you ain't singing Dom Sheldon, Mike. What the? You slick, Mike. You you ain't fooling nobody, Michael. 
On November 24th, 1993, Larry Feldman got a search warrant allowing Michael Jackson to be photographed completely nude to determine whether or not his penix... Penix? Wow. To determine whether or not his penis and buttocks area matched the description provided by Jordy. This infuriates me every single time someone mentions it to me or I hear about it um, online, uh, reminded of it. Michael was devastated over this. Michael was always very, very shy. He was not sexually promiscuous, at least not in the public eye that we know of. Um, He was very, very conservative in that way. He, he was, and like he said on Oprah, he was a gentleman. He didn't like to cross those boundaries. And now all of a sudden, for no reason, because these allegations were not true, he's being photographed naked. That, that's, that, that's always just, just blown my mind a little bit. And just, I, I feel so terribly for Michael. I, I can't even, I can't even express it. Um, so Jordy, that, that description provided by Jordy, Jordy said that Michael's penis was circumcised and that there were discolorations on Michael's penis and buttocks area, probably as a result of his vitiligo, vitiligo, which he had previously spoken about on Oprah. And Jordy drew the famous drawing, the little, he drew a, he drew a dick, a circumcised penis, and on it, it, he wrote, Michael is circumcised. And so the body search took place on December 20th, 1993. And Jackson's attorneys weren't afforded a copy of the affidavit affidavit indicating the reason for probable cause or even what they were looking for. And so Michael requested that everyone leave the room, except for Dr. Arnold Klein, Michael's physician, and his personal photographer, Louise Swain, um, I think it's Louise or Lewis. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Um, Sergeant Gary Spiegel, the sheriff's office photographer, and the DA's termatologist, Dr. Richard Strick. So it's just them in the room with Michael. And here's... <laughs> Jordy. Jordy was so wrong. Um, so... About Michael being circumcised, um, he that that was a damning mistake that Jordy made. Michael was not my, Michael was not circumcised. He was uncircumcised, and it's corroborated in the um, autopsy report from two thousand and nine. And I can link that for you down below. And and how how would Jordy have been able to make that mistake? He would have known the difference between a circumcised and an uncircumcised penis had he been as up close and personal with it as he had claimed. If he had MJ's little MJ's all up in his grill, like over the course of of a few times, like why, (laughs) how could you not know that it wasn't circumcised? You know what I mean? So, moving on to the discoloration of MJ's penis, Jordan said that there was a light-colored spot on the underside of, of Michael's little Michael. And yes, according to Sergeant Spiegel, who took the pictures, who, or who was supposed to take the pictures, rather, the spot was present when they had Michael rearrange his little MJ's. Now, Sergeant Spiegel... The sheriff's appointed photographer claimed to have seen the spot, but neglected to take a single photo of it. He had the camera. He took pictures of everything else, but did not take pictures of the spot, the discoloration. And yeah, according to Sergeant Spiegel, the spot was present, but he didn't take the photo. And he claimed that the reason why he didn't take the picture was because he didn't have the proper equipment or lighting gear to adequately photograph the area. But then, oh my god, however, you know, at a later time, Sergeant Spiegel contradicted himself during an interview with Geraldo Rivera in 2009, saying he was told that Jordy's description match, 
confirming that he himself did not make the determination. You know who did? Tom Snedden did. Tom Snedden had a hard-on for Michael Jackson and would only serve to further prove that by representing the Arvizos in 2005, which is crazy to me, and I don't know how that wasn't a conflict of interest. But anyway, I digress. So they knew they were going to take the pictures, right? The sheriff's department knew that they were going to Michael Jackson's house to take pictures of his dingling, his thingy thing. And they knew that they had to get all up in there to take pictures. So why didn't they come prepared? Why wouldn't they have brought the right camera equipment or the right lighting gear? I mean, it's, it's, it's bullshit. And then he said there was nobody to help him. Even if he did have the equipment, there was nobody around to help him hold the the flash and all this and that. And I'm like sitting here just in my mind, counting off the people who were in the room who could have fucking hold, held. It's not rocket science to hold a flash, my friend. Like, anybody could have done it. So anyway, also, to dispute the rumor that Michael bleached his skin in an attempt to rid his body of any markings or discolorations, remember that Michael and his attorneys were denied access to the affidavit that explicitly expressed Jordan's depiction of Michael's anatomy and everything that they were looking for. Michael didn't even know that there was a spot that needed to be hidden. And Lisa, in the, in the article that I'm, um, that I'm referring to a lot here, Lisa put it quite aptly in her article that MJ didn't just regrow foreskin to prove his innocence either. Michael and his attorneys did not know what the sheriff's department were coming to Neverland to do and what they were looking for until they got there. And even when they got there, like I said, they were not able to view the affidavit, even when Michael's attorneys asked. So how is Michael supposed to hide something that he doesn't even know needs to be hidden? You tell me. I'll wait. Also, if there truly was a spot of discoloration underneath MJ's penis, how could Jordy have seen that? while also missing the fact that Michael's dick was uncircumcised. Jordy's a Jewish boy. He knows what a circumcision is and what it looks like. Jordy also claims that the first sexual contact between the two of them, well, I shouldn't say Jordy claims, I should say Evan Chandler claims, but, you know, we'll, we'll just say Jordy claims that the first sexual contact between the two of them happened in Morocco when they took a bath together. If that did happen, which it didn't, I'm sure Jordy would have gotten a full graphic image of what Michael's penis truly looked like, and its description would have matched. Absolutely, and the sheriff's department would have taken all the pictures, published a calendar, and called it a day. And in the 1995 primetime live interview with Diane Sawyer, Michael denied that the the description matched, and Lisa Marie said that when the description did not match, the newspapers only printed it in a little tiny tiny article detailing that fact in like super small print why did you why am i still here then you're not gonna ask me about that are you (laughs) sorry about the markings (laughs) you can volunteer no i'm just the point is is that when that finally got concluded that there was no matchup then it was printed this big as opposed to how big it was what the matchup was supposed to be it didn't work it never it never it isn't so and then diane she ignored their statements completely she didn't even touch on it That's just shitty, shitty reporting. I'm sorry, Diane Sawyer, you can suck my toe. And on December 22nd, 1993, Michael issued the statement from Neverland Ranch via satellite. There have been many disgusting statements made recently concerning allegations of improper conduct on my part. These statements about me are totally false. As I have maintained from the very beginning, I am hoping for a speedy, in to this horrifying, horrifying experience to which I have been subjected. So now we are getting to the part with the settlement. Settle! Settle, 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 settle! On January 25th, 1994, the Los Angeles DA's office decided it would not pursue the alleged criminal extortion attempts against Michael. And this set the stage for a settlement. And they reached this decision because... It, it kind of would have been really ridiculous for the DA to build a case for molestation against Michael while also bringing charges against Evan for extortion. You see, that just doesn't make any sense. And the DA's office knew it, so they, they weren't going to go forward with it. 
and Michael was advised by his friends to settle. I talk to my lawyers and I said, can you guarantee me that justice will prevail? And they said, Michael, we cannot guarantee you that a judge or a jury will do anything. And with that, I was like catatonic. I was outraged. How much money? Totally was it? outraged. So what I said, I have got to do something to get out from under this nightmare. All these lies and all these people coming forward to get paid and, the, and these tabloid shows, just lies, 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 lies. So what I did, we got together again with my advisors and they advised me, it was hands down, a unanimous decision, resolve the case. This could be something that could go on for seven years. How much money we said, was let's it? get it behind us. Can you say get how it? much? It's not what the tabloids have printed. It's not all this crazy outlandish one. No, it's not at all. I mean, the terms of the agreement are very confidential. I want to ask. barred to discuss it. They, they, the specific the specific terms. terms. You know, so it's specific amounts. The, the idea <clears throat> is just isn't fair. What they put me through, because there wasn't one piece of information that says I did that. And anyway, they turned my room upside down, went through all my books, all my videotapes, what? all my private things, and they found nothing, nothing, nothing that can say Michael Jackson did this. Nothing. But let me ask you to a this couple day, of questions. Nothing. Let, Still nothing. Let me ask nothing, you a couple. Nothing. 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 <laughs> Now, there's there's conflicting reports, whether if it was Elizabeth Taylor who was urging him or if it was his legal advisors pushing him or if it was a combination of the two or three or four, whoever was involved in advising him to settle. Now, me personally, I, I feel like financially I would have settled because, yeah, I, I, I would have won that case still. But we're going to go into just how much this case was going to cost. And, you know, let's just go into it now. Um, it's cheaper to settle than to pay for year-round legal fees. Because you, you got to keep in mind, these, these cases, it's not like an episode of Law & Order where it lasts an hour and then everybody's good to go. No, no, these things go on. Civil suits can drag on for like three to five years, and that's you know, a, a, a speedy one. That's a quick one, you know? And, um, and also Michael didn't settle out of his own pocket. Let's just clear that up right now. Michael did not pay out of his own pocket. Michael's insurer paid. And there's proof of that as well. So when the claim of negligence was filed against Michael, because remember those seven uh, claims from earlier, Negligence was one of them, and negligence was the magic word. And once that claim came to light and was filed against Michael, it immediately became an insurance issue, making Michael's insurance liable, and thus it made them involved to fund a settlement. There, there, there was a claim that there was no proof that Michael's insurance company paid the Chandlers. That changed in 2005 when Michael's attorney, Tom Mesereau, the mean G, filed legal papers to preclude evidence of the 93 settlement amount, specifically because Michael did not have control over the settlement in what is called an attorney memorandum. And that stated, the plaintiff seeks to introduce evidence of the civil settlement of the 1993 lawsuit through the testimony of Larry Feldman, attorney for the current complaining family and attorney for the plaintiff in the 1993 matter. The settlement agreement was for global claims of negligence, and the lawsuit was defended by Mr. Jackson's insurance carrier. The insurance carrier negotiated and paid the settlement over the protests of Mr. Jackson and his personal legal counsel. Now, some people think insurers can't make you settle a lawsuit, but they absolutely can. They absolutely can. They can provide you with an attorney and pay for a judgment up to the policy limits. And Lisa uses a really good example in her article, you know how when you get into a car accident and all of a sudden there's a claim against you, like your insurance company is, is handling all of that. That that has nothing to do with you. I remember I rear-ended somebody one time. Yes, it was all my fault. <laughs> and um, I was just fucking around with the radio. Um, I was also going like three miles an hour, you know, barely a scratch on the cars. But this lady had filed a claim saying that, you know, her neck, her back, her neck and her back and it hurt and whatever. And so my insurance company had to pay her out and my um, premium stuff, everything went up. Fucking assholes. But anyway, that's how it works. Okay. And 
the uh, the standard um, wordage in an indemnity policy says, we may at our discretion investigate any occurrence and settle any claim or suit that may result, end quote. Once the insured is sued, the insurer can make any settlements that are in its best interest. And more often than not, they choose to settle for less than the cost of defense. Because remember, insurance companies are in the business of making money. And how do they make money? By not spending, (laughs) by not spending all their money. So they choose to settle versus paying all this money um, in legal fees. And um, they did a... um, an estimate for how much it would have cost annually to to cover legal fees and um, year round, and it would have amounted to twenty million dollars annually over the course of three to five years, and that does not include um, paralegals and investigators and 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 just standard litigation costs. So you're looking at five, three to five times the amount that Jordan Chandler was asking for. Um, yeah, the insurance company was going to settle. Didn't matter what Michael said. (laughs) They were going to settle. So all parties involved ended up signing a confidential settlement agreement, not a confidentiality agreement. There's a difference, big difference. And the agreements, they're, they're available online to view and I'll, I'll find them and I'll, I'll, I'll post them up. Um, and the, the agreement of the settlement also left the door open to Jordy for him to come back later and file criminal charges before the statute of limitations expired against Michael. But Jordy never did. Nobody ever came back and said anything, except for Evan, but I'll get to that. The family basically took the money and ran, which was the plan from the get-go. This is what they were after the entire time. Just the money. They weren't. They didn't want criminal suits. They didn't want anything like that. Evan Chandler wanted money. Cash money, and he fucking got it. I swear to God, there's no, there's no justice out here, none. So as if twenty million dollars was not enough to satiate Evan Chandler, Evan tried to sue MJ again, but this time in the amount of sixty million dollars, claiming Michael violating violated the terms of the confidential settlement agreement by denying molestation claims on the Diane Sawyer interview. You remember the Diane Sawyer interview? When Michael said that the molestation charges were lies, lies, lies. It was just lies, 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 lies. So Evan Chandler claimed that Michael's statement violated the terms of the settlement agreement. And then it, it further damaged the family's reputation. And trust me, Evan... You don't need any help from MJ in that regard. You done did that yourself. So anyhow, he also claimed that when Michael wrote They Don't Care About Us, the song portrayed Evan in in a sour light, claiming that the lines Jew me, sue me, and kick me, kike me were about him since he was Jewish and claimed the statements to be derogatory. In a song you say Jew me, sue me, and some people are saying that that is anti-Semitic. It's not anti-Semitic because I'm not a racist person. I could never be a racist. I love all races of people from Arabs to Jewish people, like I said before, to blacks. But when I say Jew me, sue me, everybody do me, kick me, kike me, don't you black or white me, I'm talking about myself as the victim. You know, my, my accountants and lawyers are Jewish. My three best friends are Jewish. David Geffen, Jeffrey Katzenberg, Steven Spielberg, Mike Milken. These are friends of mine. They're all Jewish. So how does that make sense? I was raised in a Jewish community. See, this, this is the, the mark of a true sociopath. He thinks everything's about him. Like, he's the only Jewish person that, that around, you know? And that's not even why Michael put that in the song. It's supposed to be... Um, like, what's the word I'm looking for? And I, and I really don't want to get into this whole debate. I'll probably do this another time um, about the um, the so-called racist lyrics and they don't care about us. We all know that it's not, he's not trying to be racist. It's the equivalent of um, Childish Gambino's music video, This Is America. He's not saying that we should all shoot each other and we should be okay that this is America. He's doing it to incite a reaction to, it's almost like satire in a way, because he's trying to show you how ridiculous this looks and ridiculous this sounds, and Michael was doing the same thing. But anyway, I digress. I will talk more about that another time. So anyway, back to this new uh, lawsuit. Uh, The matter ended up 
uh, being submitted to arbitration on July 26, 1999. And the arbitrator ruled that the confidential settlement agreement said that neither party was guilty of any crime, so Michael didn't damage Chandler's reputation by declaring innocence. See what I mean? So the matter was disposed in June 2001, and the arbitrator ordered Evan to pay Michael's attorney's fees. <laughs> so a lot of that uh, $20 million <laughs> that he got from Michael in 93 um, was pretty much paid back <laughs> to Michael and his attorneys. So I guess there you go. I guess it's got sort of a poetic justice when you think about it. After the... Uh, the allegations in 93 and then this uh, really pathetic attempt at another cash grab in 99, things kind of quieted down for the Chandlers until 2005. And we all know 2005 is the year of the trial. And it's interesting because all of a sudden tensions got high again in the Chandler household. Jordy and Evan were living together in a real luxury building. It overlooked the Hudson in New York City. Real fancy high to do up. I wonder how he paid for it. But anyway, it's there's a, a police report stating, and a whole trial and everything, that Evan came up from behind Jordy and hit him with a 12 and a half pound dumbbell. And then... After Jordy fell to the ground, obviously incapacitated, Evan sprayed him in the face with mace. You know, just for good measure, just in case, just in case he decided to stand up after being concussed. You never know. So after going to trial and for and and first being denied a, a permanent restraining order, Jordy was finally able to obtain it on June of 2006 and. I don't think anybody's seen him since. I know that he hasn't been found. He wasn't found for the uh, 2017 um, Wade Robson um, ordeal. Um, he skipped town. I mean, the, the boy has essentially vanished. You know? So, that's pretty telling in and of itself. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to this, too, because I have... I have a theory, and it's kind of crazy, and it includes the Arvizos, but you have to hear me out because I, I think I think it, it, it could be a possibility. I mean, stranger things have happened. No, no, listen, be listen, 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 you listen, listen, Linda. So anyway, on November 17th, 2009, Evan Chandler killed himself. He was found inside his luxury apartment in Jersey City. Because he, he missed a doctor's appointment. It was a real important doctor appointment. And when he didn't show up, his doctor um, called, to do, called authorities to do a wellness check. And he was found dead of a gunshot wound. And he was cremated. Nobody came to his cremation. No friends, no family, just alone. And he didn't leave a suicide note. And a lot of people speculate. I speculated that he killed himself because of the guilt he faced after Michael's passing. But we'll never know with absolute certainty why he did it. I mean, honestly, it's probably a, a accumulation of, of a bunch of things, including the 93 allegations, everything in 1999, the estrangement between him and Jordy, obviously the estrangement between him and his ex-wife. He had no friends. He was a son of a bitch. You know, he, it's, uh, and that can get to a person. Um, again, I, I mean, somebody taking their life that way is terrible already. I mean, it's, uh, it's no good to be in that place, but I will not pretend to have any sympathy for Evan Chandler ever. So now I'm going to go ahead and move on to my theory. And please, please hang on because I think, I mean, it is kind of crazy and a little far-fetched, but hey, that's why they call it a theory. And that's why this show is called The MJ Theory. So here we go. I think that somehow, some way, Evan Chandler was involved in the 2005 trial between the Arvizos and Michael Jackson. What? What the fuck? I know. I know. It's a little crazy, but but hear me out, okay? So the Arvizos did everything backwards the way that Evan did it. 
And remember, Evan, Evan kept on coming back to get Michael. Remember, after the the case was closed in 93 and the settlement happened, Evan came back in 99 for another $60 million on some bullshit claims that Michael was violating the confidentiality or the confidential settlement agreement. And which we all know was bullshit. He knew it was bullshit. He was just trying to do another cash grab. Didn't work. So I think that he... I don't think that he planned it from the beginning with the Arvizos. I think that he became involved somewhere down the line. Because remember, it was the same attorneys. It was Tom Sneddon, Larry Feldman. It was the same psychiatrist, um, Mathis Abrams. And, and, And even the claims were the same, just elevated. Just like they went even further and they dug the wrench even deeper and they fabricated more and more and more lies. And and, and and I will tell you about the the Arvizo case and just how much of that was, was a setup. And it, it is astonishing how any of this made it into a courtroom. I, I, I Like I said in the beginning of this episode, I'm flabbergasted. Flabbergasted. It is blasphemy. Okay? Blasphemy. Yes. That, that, I- that! That is blasphemous. That is blasphemous. So, like I said, I think that Evan Chandler kind of wiggled his way into this trial somehow and was helping the Arvizos and helping Tom Sneddon. Because you've got two people, Tom Sneddon and Evan Chandler, who just could not let it go. Evan Chandler, money hungry. Tom Sneddon, who was just a cold man. So... (laughs) So you got you you've got the perfect storm for for more extortion, more setups, just just out of sheer desperation to get at Michael. And Tom Sneddon and Evan wanted to get at Michael for two completely different reasons. Evan because he has loathed Michael for splitting up his family. And if you read the because I, I I'm gonna link below the um what's it called the transcripts from the phone conversation between David and Evan. He says it right there, point blank. I hate Michael for tearing up my family. And you'll and you'll read it and um come to your own conclusion. But this is that's my conclusion. He it's not even it's not even my conclusion, it's Edmund's conclusion. He hated Michael for tearing up his family. And that's it. Point blank period. Signed, sealed, delivered. I'm yours. That's just it. That's just how it was. And so um yeah, back to this whole theory. I think that Evan teamed up with the Arvizos, and that is why I think things got real heated between Jordy and Evan a couple of months later. Remember how Evan, you know, beat Evan nine ways to Sunday, excuse me, he beat uh, Jordy nine ways to Sunday with a 12-pound dumbbell and then maced him in the face, you know, and and you don't just do that for no reason, you know, so I think that the, the pressures of Evan being involved low-key behind the scenes in the 2005 trial may have gotten to him or Jordy either knew about it or he found out about it and that's when this whole um, physical assault and battery started happened um, so yeah there, there's just these little things that just it just it makes you wonder and again this is just a theory this is not conclusive this is not there's no evidence to support this other than what i'm i'm piecing together from from what i've read and what i see and just the similarities and even the contrasts between these two the two court cases and and like i said the arvizos did things a little bit differently than evan did evan was probably kicking himself for not doing a criminal trial and trying to win a criminal trial because if you win the criminal trial not only do you uh, destroy Michael's career and his life and send him to prison but you also get to go in later to do a civil suit to get money from his estate or his insurance companies blah 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 what have you you get to sue again and Evan didn't do that the first time around so he lost twice and so the Arvizos went in they did the criminal trial claiming they didn't want you know anything they didn't didn't have anything to do with money but their whole background has to do with extorting people out of money louise palinker george lopez uh chris tucker uh, there's one more that i'm forgetting um but i will go more into 
the Arvizos and how they reached into the pockets of countless celebrities. They duped their own city with a fundraiser for Gavin. They duped an entire city. And I, they sued JCPenney. I will go into this for you guys and I will give you guys all the information. I will tell you though, just to brush up for you guys, I would start reading um, the court transcripts of the 2005 trial because I am going to be pulling it all my information straight from the source, which is going to be the transcripts of that trial, which I have already read and I'll be going over it again. And then I'll probably pull a few things from from outer sources here and there just to get a full, well-rounded view of everything that was going on. Um, so yeah, that's my theory. And you can tell me how you feel about it, if you feel like it holds water, or if you think it's just my imagination getting the better of me. These are just the things that keep me up at night, people. <laughs> um, all right, so that does it for this episode of The MJ Theory. Thank you so much for joining me on this one, and be sure to tune in next time when I do the uh, the Arvizos versus Michael Jackson episode. That one is going to be so great. I cannot wait. I cannot wait to tear the Arvizos apart. It's been a long time coming. I cannot wait. I cannot wait to have you here with me again next week. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye. Yeah. You want to see me spin? Watch. Yeah.